One. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, tonight, we're very fortunate that Dr. Namdari has organized a wonderful webinar for us on coding and reimbursement. This is a really a hot topic area and an area of significant interest among the membership of ASES. So tonight, we'll have some interesting presentations followed by some discussion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Namdari. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Sperling. So um, I'd like to thank the ASCS um, and in particular the Practice Management Task Force that is chaired by Dr. Sperling um, and our board liaison, Dr. Duralde, for um, taking an interest in this topic and inviting us to, to do this webinar. Um, you know, I think we all know that um, as far as our reimbursement goes from a physician standpoint, it continues to go down even though we as the surgeons represent only a very small, less than 10% um, part of the overall cost of an operation. Um, so um, for us to optimize our ability to remain solvent and, and to maintain our practice structures, um, you know, it's important to really understand these topics well. So, you know, we put together a webinar that I think is interesting. Um, please take part in our discussion. So at the end of this, um, we will have the opportunity for a discussion. So please ask questions, use the chat, and um, I'll do my best to, to relay those questions to our, to our expert panel. So I and the other co-authors have disclosures that can be found on the AOS website. I'd like to introduce our panel and, uh, you know, we really have great people here. So this is Scott Paxton, um, Associate Professor, University of Orthopedics, which is a private practice affiliated with uh, Brown University. So, you know, Scott is in true private practice, but in a hybrid model, and he's co-director of the Shoulder and Elbow Fellowship there. He'll be talking about best practices for optimal in-office coding um, in 2022. Then we'll have uh, Paul Sethi, who's a part of orthopedic and neurosurgery specialist. Um, he's the president of the ONS Foundation for Clinical Research and Education, very entrepreneurial, um, true private practice model and recent uh, private equity participant. So a unique perspective. And Paul will be talking on surgical coding, how to tackle common and complex procedures. And then we have Nick Verma, who's professor of orthopedics at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, also a private practice hybrid type model. He's director of the Division of Sports Medicine and fellowship director. He's team physician for the Chicago White Sox and Bulls. And he'll be talking about how to um, maximize use of physician extenders in the office and in the OR setting. So just a few real disclaimers. We are not billing experts. You know, this is, uh, it, you could look at this as the blind leading the blind, but really we've tried to pick people with, um, with practices that are, um, that target these areas and an interest in these areas. You know, we, we may have taken billing courses, but we don't have any special certifications in billing. So um, the hope is that we learn from each other's experience. Our tips for success, regardless of um, what you do from here on out, is meet with your billing department, track your billing, attend a course if it's something that um, you feel you're, you're not as up to speed uh, with as you, as you might want to be. Use a cheat sheet and always do your own coding. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Scott, who will give us our, our first talk. I'll stop sharing. Scott, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you, Serena. Um, so yeah, my name is Scott Paxson. I am in uh, private practice. I do all my own coding. I don't do my own billing, but I do all my own coding. And my reimbursement uh, is directly tied to um, my coding uh, and how many, uh, how much uh, revenue uh, is brought in. So it behooves me to be up to date on these things and to be able to code um, aggressively, but accurately, appropriately, legally. Um, so. Serena and I kind of on the same page. Um, I am not a professional biller. I don't have any advanced training in medical coding or billing, um, but I do have a lot of skin in the game given that uh, my livelihood is tied to it. Um, I don't have any other conflicts of interest related to this talk. So um, hopefully everybody on here um, is familiar with this, but um, we'll kind of go over this briefly. In 2021, um, the e updates went into effect for uh, the way office visits are billed. Um, so it really changed the entire um, way that um, Medicare, Medicaid, and then all the uh, subsequent payers 
looked at what you're doing in the office and how they're reimbursing you for uh, the work that you do. Um, so previously it was based on three things, the history, the exam, and the medical decision-making. And it was not uncommon to see notes that had very uh, lengthy histories um, in them, uh, having to hit certain bullet points. Uh, and then an exam, you know, you'd see somebody, seeing somebody for a carpal tunnel and they'd have, you know, percussing the abdomen and looking at cranial nerves um, to hit all those bullet points. Um, so that was kind of in the past. Additionally, you could also bill by time, um, but it had to be greater than 50% dedicated to counseling or care coordination. That was kind of some of those buzzwords that people would put um, in their notes. Additionally, the criteria for a follow-up visit, say a 99214, which would be a level four follow-up visit was different um, than a new patient visit. So there was different things you needed to do um, to get to a level four follow-up versus a level four new patient. So January, 2021, that changed. The history and the exam portions um, went away and everything is now based on medical decision-making. And that's broken down into three different areas. The problems that you assess, the data that you review, um, and the overall risk uh, of the encounter. And we'll get into those things in just a minute. Time is still able to be used. I actually don't use time uh, really very much at all because I find that I can get to higher levels of billing um, just by uh, using the medical decision making. So I don't use time because the time amounts are relatively high. I don't generally spend 45 minutes or an hour with a patient, uh, but it is still available and it does not have to be dominated by counseling or coordination of care. Um, but for this uh, short talk, we're really going to focus on the medical decision making uh, aspect of things. And additionally, uh, the criteria for follow-up visits uh, is the exact same as for a new patient. So to bill for a 99214 versus a 99204, it's the exact same criteria. There's no difference from follow-ups or um, new patients. In the past, we all may have, may have had these rules like, okay, well, the, if I see a follow-up that one, uh, as a new patient that one of my partners has seen, maybe you saw them for their knee, I'm seeing them for their shoulder, I'm generally going to bill a level four follow-up. But when I see new patients, I'm going to bill a level three that's kind of gone out uh, the window a little bit because it's the same criteria for both. So um, my key takeaway from the changes, um, it's possible for most orthopedic surgeons to get to a level four, which is 99204 and 99214 and a level five visit much more often in the past, really for what I did, I'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon and for what most orthopedic surgeons did, really it wasn't uh, appropriate to bill for a level four or level five um, because you had to have medical necessity to do a lot of those um, physical exam maneuvers, um, which really you could not make much of an argument of why you needed to do those uh, physical exam maneuvers for some of the problems we're seeing. That's not as much of an issue anymore. Documentation is really important um, as it's always been, but it's different. So what you what you need to document has changed. Those lengthy histories and review systems and all those things, while they may be very important medically and to take care of a patient, they don't really do anything um, for you in terms of coding and billing. Um, and so there's importance placed on documenting other things that you may think that someone would take for granted reading your note, such as alternative treatments, documents that you may have, have reviewed, um, certain risks, uh, risks of things that you did not perform, but you considered. Because um, as we'll see, um, there are uh, certain things for making a decision to do something. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to do it but you have to make a decision for that. Um, and I will say that in 2021, compared to the year before with a pretty consistent uh, number of patient visits in the office, my office visit work RVUs went up about 50%. Um, so this is one of the areas, unlike um, you know, reimbursement for um, surgical procedures and other things where actually we are getting paid a bit more. The number of RVUs per code has gone up and the ability to get to higher uh, levels has gone up as well. So uh, I would really um, recommend that you fully uh, educate yourself on how to maximize your billing. So cheat sheets, as Dr. Uh, Namdari said, um, these are really helpful. They're especially helpful in the beginning and just to get you learning about um, how to break down what you're going to document, how you're going to document it, how you're going to code. After using it for a month or two, you're not going to need it anymore. Um, this is relatively busy, but it shows here. Uh, this is a cheat sheet from our group that um, our coding department put together. But again, we have this problem column, we have the data evaluated column, and we have the risk column. Um, and so we'll go through these three uh, 
portions and then an example here at the end. So problems, um, it's a bit of a busy slide. Um, when, it, when it's broken down, there are chronic problems and acute problems. So with the, um, aside from kind of these self-limited or minor problems or these minimal problems, which are pretty uh, self-explanatory, when we go to the acute problem, there's an acute uncomplicated illness or injury. Um, and this is something that has little to no risk of mortality with treatment with full recovery without functional impairment as expected. Maybe a tennis elbow or something like that. Um, then we have an acute illness or acute complicated injury, I'm sorry. Um, and this is something that requires uh, treatment, uh, possibly evaluation of body symptoms that are not directly part of the injured organ um, or, or the injury is extensive or the treatment options are multiple and or associated with risk of morbidity. And we'll go over that definition of morbidity, um, but it's a bit subjective. So um, anytime, you know, for me, the majority of fractures, tendon tears, things where surgery is, is a possibility, acute complicated injuries. Um, we also have acute illness with systemic symptoms. I don't find that I really use that one much. I don't think it's overly um, applicable to orthopedic surgeons, or at least the kind of orthopedics that I do. Um, and then, you know, down here, acute illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. Those aren't things you're going to see in the office too much, um, or you're going to see them quite rarely. And then we have these chronic problems. So interestingly, for chronic illness, so this stable chronic illness, um, the way they define chronicity is something that's over a year. So one year is the time point. And then stable has an interesting definition. Um, so they say for the purposes of categorizing medical decision making it is defined by the specific treatment goals for the individualized patient. So what that means is it's only considered stable if the treatment goals have been met. So if they have arthritis and it's been at a constant level three or four pain for four years, but that's not the goal of the patient, that is not a stable chronic problem. Um, that is down here, the chronic illness with exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment. So really these stable chronic illnesses, that's gonna be, you know, you see somebody for their annual, um, you know, evaluation of their knee arthroplasty, their hip arthroplasty, and they're doing absolutely fine. It's well controlled. Their treatment goals have been met. So down here, there's chronic illness with exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment. This is something that doesn't meet that first definition. So it's worsening, it's poorly controlled, meaning it hasn't met the patient's um, treatment goals yet, um, or it's progressing. And so in worsening arthritis, worsening tendonitis, it could be anything that's been going on for greater than a year that uh, is not at the treatment goal of the patient. And then we have this chronic illness down here with severe exacerbation. Um, and so what that is, um, is that the severe exacerbation progression of a chronic illness or severe side effects of treatment. So it could be something, a post-op issue or a, a, an issue with treatment that somebody else has provided um, that have significant risk of morbidity and may require hospital level care. Some of the examples they give, this one I don't think makes a lot of sense, but this is what we provided. Patient with diabetes and chronic rotator cuff tear, sugars increase after recent injection, now a decision for surgery is being made. For me, I think anybody who's had this problem going on for longer than a year that now is gonna undergo surgery, you know, arthritis, it's gonna have an arthroplasty, a chronic rotator cuff tear, um, that's gonna have a surgery. Um, it's gonna require generally a hospital level of care um, for that procedure. So on to the next section, the data reviewed. Um, so we're just gonna go through the criteria a little bit, but there's limited, which I'm gonna start breaking these down by the level, cause we all kinda of wanna to get to that level four and five. So limited would be just to get to level three. And so you have to meet the requirements of at least one out of the two categories. Category one is test and document. So any combination of the following, review of a prior external note from each unique source, review of result of each unique test, ordering of a unique test, or assessment requiring an independent historian, meaning you talk to a, um, someone with special needs guardian, uh, an elderly patient who's demented, you talk to their son, daughter, um, whatever that may be. But really, um, you only have to review one record, um, one test uh, to get to that level three. Um, where we really want to get is that level four and that level five. And these are based pretty much on the same criteria. But for level four, you have to hit one out of three. And for level five, you have to hit two out of three. So the first category, test documents, independent historians. 
So any combination of the three for the following review of prior external notes from each unique source, review of results of each unique test, ordering of each unique test. So that means if you'd order an X-ray of a shoulder and it's gonna be done elsewhere, not somewhere where you're reading the, it, but you're, they're gonna to go to a hospital or a surgery center or something, you order an X-ray, you review a uh, report of an X-ray of a humerus and you look over one of their previous um, primary care doctor notes, that's three right there. So you've met the criteria for category one and you'd be at moderate uh, or 99204 level for the data reviewed um, area. Um, or for this one, assessment requiring an independent historian. So again, talking to that extra person. The second category is independent interpretation of a test. Um, so this is a test performed by a different physician I find that um, the most common um, time that this happens is patient gets a CT scan or an MRI, you review it yourself, which you're generally gonna do anyway, um, not just look at the report. Looking at the report gets you one of these category one kind of checks, but actually looking at the exam yourself and interpreting it yourself, I've reviewed the MRI, it looks like they have a tear of the supraspinatus, that gets you a check for this category two. Um, and then category three, discussion of management or test interpretation with another um, doctor. So you talk to their hematologist, you talk to their cardiologist, you talk to a, a, another physician on their care team, um, uh, or test, you, you talk to their radiologist about the uh, MRI and you both go over it together, whatever it may be, if you talk with another physician. So getting to two out of the three of these is not that difficult um, for the correct patient um, if, if the information is out there. Um, and that'll get you to that level five. And then the final one is risk. And I found this a bit interesting. It's a little wordy, these slides, but this is how it's listed. Definition of risk are based upon the usual behavior and thought processes of a physician or other qualified healthcare professional in the same specialty. Trained cl clinicians apply common language usage meanings to terms such as high, medium, low, or minimal risk and do not require quantification for these definitions though quantification may be provided when evidence-based medicine has established probabilities. For the purposes of medical decision-making, level of risk is based upon consequences of the problems addressed at the encounter when appropriately treated. Risk also includes medical decision-making related to the need to or initiate or forego further testing, treatment, and or hospitalization. So a lot of subjective terms in here. Um, you know, it's not quite that checkbox, did you examine, you know, motion, did you examine stability? Um, it's relatively subjective. There's some examples provided, but really it's a, it's a bit subjective. And then this de definition of morbidity that they give, a state of illness or functional impairment that is expected to be of substantial duration during which function is limited. Quality of life is impaired or there's organ damage that may not be transient despite treatment. Um, so, you know, if they're gonna have any long-term issue with whatever you're doing, um, they're gonna have some morbidity again, these subjective terms, um, such as substantial duration, you know, th these are not quantitative terms. So some, uh, some examples here, minimal risk, that's the lowest you can get. So it's really anything gets you there. Moving up to low risk, the examples I give over-the-counter medicines, OT, PT, pretty much the baseline patient that we would see kind of gets you to level three. There, there aren't a whole lot of level twos, I don't think, um, that we're seeing. Moderate risk, prescription drug management, decision regarding minor surgery with identified patient or procedure risk factors. For me, what I consider minor surgery, they don't really ever have a definition of it, uh, but I consider um, in-office injections to be a minor surgery. They, um, they have a CPT code associated with it or a CPT code associated with a closed treatment um, of a fracture. And then this one doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but decision regarding elective major surgery without patient or procedure risk factors. I don't really perform any elective major surgeries that do not have procedure risk factors. Uh, if you ever find them, let me know, because um, I'd like to specialize in those. But um, every surgery that we do, I think, has risk. That's where that documentation becomes important to list out that risk. Um, and then high risk. Decision regarding major surgery with identified patient or procedure risk factors, decision regarding emergency major surgery, or decision regarding hospitalization. So I think most of the procedures that we do really fall into this level five. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that you make the decision to have surgery, 
but it's a decision regarding. So you may elect not to have the major surgery. That's where the documentation comes in, listing the procedure that you decided not to perform and what the risks of that procedure would have been. Um, so to finish up here, I'll just show you how I do this in my own setting. I have a text macro that I put at the end of every single note that I use that I've made with drop down menus. And I find this to be really helpful. And also, I think if I ever were to get audited, um, it's pretty straightforward to, for someone to see what my uh, thought process was on how I build the level that I did. So I have, you know, the problems here and then kind of what level that gets me, um, all the ones that we listed before. I have um, kind of the specific um, records or tests that I normally would see, which would be x-rays, MRIs, CTs. For your practice, that may be bone scans, and it may be EMG nerve conduction studies, it, depending on what your um, subspecialty is. I would recommend putting on this um, macro if you if, if you make one um, things that are easily to check off easy to check off that you do. Um, then I have this independent interpretation of tests um, on, on there. Um, what if I look at a CT? If I look at an MRI on my own, or if I discuss management with another doctor? And then again, the risk here at the bottom, minimal, low, and then for the moderate and high, um, I put the examples that have been provided um, with it. So for example, here, this is a quick case. So a patient with a proximal humerus fracture is seen in the ER, follows up with you, and decision is made for an ORIF. This is not uh, you know, an uncommon situation for me. With a little extra documentation of things that you basically already do, it's pretty easy to go from a level four to a level five, and it's just about including the right thing. So before 2021, I would have billed this as a level three. Um, I would have had a difficult time getting it to a four or a five. Um, so kind of your baseline documentation, if you don't take a little extra time to put in the note, the things that you do, this is going to be an acute, complicated problem because um, there's going to be a uh, risk of morbidity with it. Data, you don't include any outside records. You probably, you know, are going to look at something from the ER. You may look at it, some old x-rays that they had, um, but oftentimes we, in the past, we wouldn't include those in our note. And then risk, I would consider this high risk. It's decision for major surgery with risk factors. So doing that, you build a 99204, you get 2.6 RVUs. That's great. With a little extra time, um, you do accurate coding. You still have an acute complicated level four problem. The data you look at is extensive. So this is where that documentation comes into um, effect. You look at the hospital ER note that the MD, uh, the ER MD wrote. You look at an x-ray report from shoulder x-rays. You look at the x-ray report from the humerus x-rays. Um, and I like to mention that in my note. That gets me my three check marks for that category one. And then I review the x-ray images of the shoulder from the hospital and I document my interpretation. Um, that gets, so that gets me to the level five on the data. And then the level five is the same on the risk. Um, and it can be as easy as just as simple here. I've reviewed the notes from the emergency room physician. I reviewed the images and the reports of the humerus and the shoulder radiographs from whenever. And I agree with the impression of a three-part varus angulated fracture of the proximal humerus. Now you've built a 99205, it's 3.5 RVUs. That's a pretty big uh, jump from 2.6. Add that up throughout the entire year. Um, and you're gonna be uh, you know, collecting a bit more. So seeking out that data, I think that, that middle column, that data is really gonna be the most important than including it in your uh, note. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Serena. Great, thanks so much, Scott. That was fantastic. Um, and and for everybody who's listening, this this talk these talks will be available um, and recorded. So you know, I know there's a lot of information here that you may want to slow down and think about more. Um, so they will be available. Um, I'd like Paul to share his screen. And and as he's doing that, Scott, maybe you could just tell us what what percent of your um, if you have a sense for it, what percent of your the patients that you see are you billing a three, four, or five? So I'd probably say uh, I'm. For new patients, uh, it's probably 30% uh, threes, 50% fours, 20% fives, maybe, maybe a little bit less of the fives, because um, oftentimes we'll see them once or twice before uh, surgery. Um, that's kind of the breakdown. Whereas before it was pretty much, well, it was 100% level threes, pretty much. Scott, it's Paul. If you don't mind, I have two questions. That was an excellent talk. First is that 
it, you clearly indicated, as I agree with you, that it's much easier to, to bill a, a level four visit at this point in time. We've noticed audits now coming in from the, from the commercial insurers upset with this ability to, to bill level fours. Have any of the other panelists or you noticed any audits coming in because of more force? I have not noticed that, um, but I potentially anticipate that. Um, you know, you get off that bell curve where you're not doing a lot of level threes, although the bell curve really should shift because they got rid of the level one. Um, but that's why I included the end kind of that little um, breakdown of exactly how I got to what level I got. So I feel like if any of my notes have been audited and I've asked our coding and billing specialists to randomly pick um, my notes and audit them on an ongoing basis, and I've met the criteria every time. So another thing to bring up just regarding office visits is the use of this modifier 25. And that's the ability to perform an injection and bill for an office visit as opposed to bill for an injection alone. Do you have any insight on that? Uh, that I do not. Um, I believe we generally do. I think there are some payers that will cut your e &M code by 50% if you do an injection at the same time. Um, but I can't tell you I'm an expert at that. I haven't gotten any... I mean, I bill for the injection, I bill for the e &M code, and I haven't heard anything back from my um, biller that it's not getting paid. So I, I can't tell you a lot more detail on that. Do you have any insight? Is that a problem for you? You know, it just seems that uh, if you had discussed, if you'd seen a person for impingement uh, in the previous office visit, and you discussed an injection at that initial visit, on the follow-up visit, there seems to be a debate whether you can bill for an office visit or for just an injection at that follow-up if you'd already discussed it? Yeah, I think it comes down to how you document. Um, same thing with pre-op visits. So if you put in your note that they are going to have surgery, once that decision for surgery has been made, when they come back to see you uh, for that pre-op visit, uh, as far as I understand, technically you cannot bill that for a visit. You have to use uh, code 99025, which is pre-op visit once the decision has been made. Um, depending on how you word it, if you say we're going to think about it, they're going to think about their options and they're going to come back and we're going to discuss it further. And then you word it to the decision is made at that next visit. I think you probably could visit, bill for it then because that's when the decision was actually made. I according think that's, to the important, documentation. that's an important tip. I think, I think that's right, Paul. You know, I, I look at this similar to visco supplementation, right? You can usually bill the EM code plus the injection for the first one, but then the subsequent injections are just an injection visit. So I think if you saw them on a Tuesday and they came back on Thursday just to have the injection, you'd have a tough time justifying another visit code. But if they came back four or six weeks later, they tried some PT, maybe they were using home anti-inflammatories, you re-examine them, and then you make a decision for an injection, then I think you could document and, and, and uh, code for it. Yeah, so, so Nick, the other gamification of that is that I, I no longer say in my initial note, if this doesn't work, we'll consider an injection even though yeah. I know that that's part of it. So that yeah. since I never documented them considering it, I can then, I can then, you know, bill both at six weeks, but yes. Okay, great. Um, let's, uh, Paul, why don't you, why don't you, you take over? Great. So uh, Serena and, and Dr. Sperling, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, uh, I, I, I saw one of your emails and I apparently was number 73 on the request list for surgical coding in the operating room. So uh, sticking me in the eyes. I appreciate this opportunity, gentlemen. Uh, just like, uh, just like um, Scott suggested, I am not a professional coder. Uh, I am not Karen Zuko. This is my opinion. And this is sort of what I've learned over the, uh, over the past years. And, and I'm sure many of those coders are listening um, and will disagree with everything I say. The good news is they disagree with each other routinely too. So there really is no happy ground on this. Uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of things we can do in the operating room uh, that allow you to, to sort of not get caught up, not to have to get a denial or have to write a, repeat, a, a letter of appeal. So again, documentation, as Scott suggested, here's two very, very easy ones that I think. First of all, distal clavicle excision. It's actually by some genius coder called distal clavulectomy. I don't know, I don't know that I'd ever used that word before. Um, and look, I, I was taught to take out between six and seven millimeters of clavicle, right? As it turns out, you need to document that you took out 10, 10 millimeters or one centimeter. So keep it simple. 
Anything less than that, they're gonna, they're gonna jack you for debridement alone. So if you're gonna do a distal clavicle, clavulectomy as the, uh, we're going to do a distal clavicle position, document that you took out a centimeter. Another one that's really simple, appropriate documentation, removal of loose bodies. Well, the, the wording on this has changed. So if you just are sort of shaving out a couple of loose floaters that are in the joint, um, it doesn't count. That goes as part, as part of your debridement. If indeed, you have to change the cannula or remove the cannula to take the loose body out, then you're allowed to throw in an extra coat, right? So simple, simple stuff. If you're gonna do the clavicle, say you did a centimeter, if you have to remove loose bodies and they fit through your cannula, it doesn't count. If it doesn't fit through your cannula, you have to pull it out, then it does count. So those are two easy, easy examples. And as you go through this, you start to learn what's worth fighting for, what's not. What about this one? Subacromal decompression, right? Well, I, I've, got a, I've got a sort of a loudspeaker on this one because this is where, and, and I'm going to sidebar it, so I apologize. This is where we need our societies, our AOS, our ASCS to really be on the horn. For some ridiculous reason, insurance companies have picked up on a couple of papers, one that maybe Dr. Verma wrote, <laughs> another one that, uh, that Dr. Levine has sort of promulgated that decompression doesn't seem to matter. And therefore, you do not get paid for it. It is part of a debridement alone. So you have to have workarounds, right? And if you're not gonna get paid, for example, Blue Cross will not, it doesn't matter if you appeal it, if you stand on your head, you write a letter, there's a form letter on the AOS website that you can send in when they deny it, you can get blue in the face. You have to have a workaround. And the workaround for these structures is now, you're gonna do different levels of debridement, right? And, and you, have, you have a debridement of a 29822, which is one or two, dis, two discrete structures, and a 29823, which is three discrete, dis, discrete structures. And as it turns out, you can really, yeah, I've got them listed here, but you, you, can, you can really identify discrete structures, three discrete structures very easily. It can be the bone, the articular cartilage. It can be the biceps tendon, which I don't believe anyone on this call has ever left alone. It can be the anchor. So the anchor, the biceps anchor and the biceps tendon are distinct. The labrum, the rotator cuff, the bursal rotator cuff, the bursa or a foreign body. So you just have to identify three of these. Now, the trick is that it has to be outside of your work area. So if you're doing a rotator cuff repair and you want to build a 29823, three distinct structures, don't include rotator cuff as one of those three that you debrided. Pretty simple. So Mr. Insurer, thank you very little for taking away the 29827. Guess what? I'm getting you back a little bit. So surgeons, enjoy this, dictate it, document it, document a rationale behind it and do it outside of your work area. And that's that perhaps is a work around. Uh, there are ways that the 29823, the extensive debridement can be included. So every once in a while, you'll get a rejection. They'll say, oh no, that's inclusive. Actually, according to the NCCI or the coding rules, it is not inclusive in rotator cuff biceps tenodesis or that one centimeter distal clavicle. So don't include one of your three uh, extensive debridements as the cuff in a cuff repair. Don't include a, a, one of those, the biceps, in one of the three in your tunodesis, and of course, don't include the, bis the, the distal clavicle in one of your three, and you can get away with that. And I think that's a way to help make your billing a little more successful with honesty, integrity, and having done that medically indicated work that you justify. This one, this one, you know, really burns burns me still to this day. And again, once again, I want I want uh, I wanted Tony Romeo when he was president of the ASCS to go and remove heads from people, and he has the capacity to remove the heads, but they don't listen. So, if you do a slap repair, and or if you do a labrum repair, it extends into the superior labrum. As it turns out, that is one code. You cannot really unbundle them. In theory, you can try and use a modifier, and we'll talk about modifiers a little bit more, and say, look, you know what? I did a little more work, and it was unrelated. However, you have to document or create a logic where the capsule defect is unrelated to the labrum tear. So in the rare situation of one of Nick's professional baseball players where you can get Hegel-type capsule tears and do bicipital work, perhaps, um, per perhaps you, can, you can get around this. But you know what? It really, it, it's very, very hard. Now, as it turns out, the NCCI, which is what the insurers listen to, and the ASCS disagree. 
actually. The ASCS website says you can indeed build these two together, but the coders and the builders say you can't. So this is when you get into an argument and as it turns out, just like when you're a resident, you know, you, you can never win, you can, it can only end. When you argue with the coders, when you argue with the insurers, you can really never win and, and it ends. So I would tell you that, look, they're, they're, you don't, don't try and get these two together. And if you do, you're just gonna end up getting, uh, getting denials or not paid on them. And I would love the rest of the group's experience on the, on the slap plus the labrum uh, in, in, towards the end of this talk. Um, this, there's this idea of modifier 22. Well, another example of where we're really getting sort of a disservice is if you repair the anterior and the posterior labrum, particularly if it's not just in continuity, or if it is, even if it's a 270 tear, right? You really don't get paid or they don't really make it easy for you to justify uh, getting additional, additional time or additional revenue for the time you spent. Similarly, if you did a, a large, you know, four anchor subscap repair and you went up top and then you had to do a suture bridge on top to the super and the infra, Really, you know, the, the, the world doesn't recognize that as two different distinct rotator cuff repairs. So you can put in this modifier 22. And in an ideal situation, you could get up to 25% additional revenue stream for putting in a modifier 22. You have to document the technical difficulty. You have to document the additional time. You can document additional portals. You can document additional anchors. You can document that tears are not in continuity. So really doing a big subscap here, it seems to make a lot of sense. That said, there's a cost of time and money. And the modifier 22, depending upon who you ask, gets paid anywhere between zero and maybe 20 or 30% of the time. So what you're doing is you're tying your revenue up, you're tying up your billing scheme uh, so that you may not, your accounts receivable may be higher and you're not getting that money. You may say, look, it doesn't matter as long as I get it eventually, but in running a responsible business, you don't want to have a large amount of funds sitting around behind you. So Modifier 22 is this wonderful idea. It makes you feel completely better that you build it, you justified it, you wrote it out. And, um, and good luck. I don't think you're going to get paid for it very frequently. This is another thing I think we need to work with billing companies and, and work with our societies to really push through. So then there's a couple of other things. What are the CPT codes for? Dermal grafts, right? Patches. They're so hot and exciting now. Balloons. Now we have the, the balloon that exists. More anchors, more sutures, masks, more passing devices. There's all sorts of things. What are the codes for that? Well, Let's go with the easy one first. Rhomplissage, getting very, very exciting. Now all these studies coming out saying subcritical bone loss, you can do a rhomplissage. Anyone name the movie? You get nothing, you lose. Good day, sir. There, you know, there's no code that you could put in for a rhomplissage and expect to get paid for. If you put in a 2999, which is what some of the billing companies uh, ask you for, I think that's probably your least chance of getting paid for anything and your greatest chance of not of, of having your funds tied up. So it, from the technical standpoint, rhomplissage is not billable. And if you say you do, you've done a rotator cuff repair and uh, an infraspinatus repair, it gets a little dicey. Uh, quick little sidebar, there, there are CPT codes, right? Those are the codes that we bill for and there are HCPCS codes, HCPCS codes, and that's what the facility both facility bills for. So the analogy is the CPT is what you get, the HICFIS is what the facility gets. So you want to be, you know, when we talk about there is no code or is no reimbursement for something, recognize that you and the facility are different, right? So now, now that we have this sort of CPT and facility code difference, let's talk about dermal graphs, right? We now have all sort or, or any graph, we have all sorts of graphs we can put on top of a, of a rotator cuff or underneath a rotator cuff to try and augment the repair and, and perhaps, you know, look at our, our predictive analysis and have fewer retears. Well, as it turns out, fortunately, many of the facilities now have a HCPCS, a HICFIS code, so that you can get reimbursed for that dermal graft or that A-flex or whatever it may be. Um, that said, there is no CPT code. So much like your rhomplissage and you get nothing, when you do this really slick dermal code, unless you build a modifier 22, the likelihood of you getting more is nothing. Um, maybe that's a good reason that you should send all these complex cases to doctors Namdari and Verma, you know, because they can spend more time. You don't get paid for it. SCR. I think there was 28,000 SCRs done in the last four years. And whether it works or not is a whole different discussion. But 
2999, which is a suggested coding for an SCR, is a lost cause. And I would suggest to you, don't bother. You should bill for a debridement, and you can bill for three structures debrided. Often you can bill for a rotator cuff. As long as you can repair part of that infraspinatus, you can't bill for it. If you can't repair part of the infraspinatus, then you can't bill for it. I would submit that in almost every case you do this in, you could probably get some infra into the graft. And you can try and be aggressive and build for a superior capsulography. And I think that's maybe, you know, where we start to stretch the line just a little bit. So that's my recommendation for SCR. Once again, my opinion, I'm not a biller. Ms. Zubko and Associates, I apologize for, for not knowing any of these answers correctly. Every time I go to one of your courses, I, I fail. What about the subacromial balloon? Uh, as it turns out, starting 4-1-2022, there is now a HICFIS code. So your facility can actually get paid for this because before there was no code for this, you were in trouble. And your facility, that includes a debridement, a decompression of chromioplasty and tenodesis. So your, your facility can't bill for anything more than that, right? But that's awesome. Now they'll tell you there is a code for this. What, 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 what they, or Striker, or whomever wants you to use this is not telling you is that there is, there is no CPT code. So Karen Zubko and Associates, at least as of 2021, and they could have changed, have suggested using a 2999, right? And that's probably the most ethical and correct pa uh, pathway for this. In my opinion, in my, my experience, the 2999s are just taking your money and throwing it out. You, you're better to buy a lottery ticket somewhere else. So what I would suggest is that you, get, you build a three compartment debridement. Hopefully you can get the get a partial cuff repair like the infra. Hopefully you can do a little tenodesis or tenotomy. And for your balloon insertion, you get a strong pat on the back. You can feel really good about doing it. Billing, you know, once again, the world is against us. So look, I went through a couple of examples. I don't think they're very good. Um, I don't think I, I know any more than anyone else. I often feel like this guy on the right, just scratching my head, wondering what has happened to us and, and much of what we do, um, because no one else can do it. And, and really, I, I, I just, when, when we get these, these emails like to help support our lobby, we really, as, as surgeons, need to continue to support our lobbies and really pressure society leaders to, to really band together and to get on the case of, uh, of this and, and, and argue strongly for the codes that we really need. So... Some advice, uh, a lot of soapbox, and a lot of I don't knows. Thank you. Paul, thank you. That was great. Um, I love the practical tips. I think those are, I wrote a couple of those down. I think will be very helpful for me. Um, as Nick's loading up his talk, um, there was a question from the chat, which, which I think Scott can answer. Scott, is there a difference when you're doing imaging at your hospital or practice versus outside, and you're reviewing those outside images in terms of the level you code? Yeah, so if you own the, um, if you're getting the facility fee, so if it's an x-ray in your office and you're also dictating the read for that, you're getting a professional component of the read, you can't also include that as an interpretation of an outside um, study. So um, it needs to be something that was done somewhere else. Uh, another entity collected the um professional side uh, for, for reading it, uh, another radiologist or somebody else read it, and another facility collected the facility fee on it, because um, otherwise you're double dipping um, on yourself. So that that does make a difference. Um, and I just had one quick uh, thing for, for Paul, for that modifier 22, something that um, actually the Karen Zupko folks um, and our billers had come up with uh, as a possible option so that your revenue doesn't get tied up as you can um, submit your regular codes for your procedure. And then after that, or after they get paid, submit the 22 um, modified um, as an addendum or a revision so that um, if they pay it, great. If they don't, you've already gotten paid for the, uh, for kind of the base amount. I love that. That's great. That's good Do you stuff. have any idea, Scott, what your reimbursement um, rate and actually hit rate on the 22s is? I actually forgot about it for like two years until right now. Um, so I don't use it because I was kind of raised in the same camp that it never gets paid. So don't even waste your time. Um, but uh, I'm going to start using it again because I honestly kind of forgot about it. Well, don't. Nick Nick and Serena, do you have any comments on 22? 
Uh, no, you know, my um, my approach has been the same as yours, Paul. Our billers um, have kind of encouraged us not to use 22 modifier or 29999 uh, because of the same issues with tying up your billing and it not really getting reimbursed. So that so we're typically when we use those codes, we're not getting paid as frequently within the first 30 days or even 90 days. So I, I pretty much stopped using it altogether. Nick? I don't use it frequently. I used it sparingly on very specific issues where there truly is an increase in labor, but um, I never track it. And if we get pushed back, I just say to drop it. So it's kind of a shot in the dark type approach. And uh, you take one shot at it and otherwise you just accept what you get normally. The other, the other comment I'll make though is, and Paul, you touched on this a little bit is, you know, on the facility side, some of these things can be big issues. So the graphs, for example, are big issues, especially if you have an ASC where it's not paid versus the hospital. Uh, that can include things like distal tibial graphs for glenoid reconstruction, the graphs for uh, rotator cuff re reconstruction. These are expensive products. And if you have fixed fee reimbursement uh, where you get a single payment for the entirety of the case, you can blow your budget pretty quickly. So not only on the professional side, you've got to think about it if you are invested in your ASC. And what we did was we actually negotiated in graphs uh, along with, because we, we got to that point because we were doing a lot of cartilage work on the knee. And so as we were negotiating contracts, we negotiated graphs to be included and we threw in the shoulder codes as well. So as you go through contract negotiations, particularly if you have the facility side uh, ownership, you've got to be thoughtful about what you're using and how to get that best paid for. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, Nick, um, we'll stay on time. Um, you're up, thank you. Perfect, you guys can see? Yep, looks good. All right, great. So I'm, I get to talk about what I think is really fun, which is the role of physician extenders. And I'm, uh, you know, the reality is these have been life-changing for me in terms of the way I practice, um, my quality of life, what I think we deliver to patients in terms of the quality of practice and the patient experience, and really allows you to scale your practice much beyond what you could do as an individual. And so hopefully we'll present to you how to use these folks, which folks may be best served for your practice, how to get some reimbursement for them, but also to, to not necessarily think about them in purely dollars and cents, but also think about them in terms of how they significantly increase the quality of your life. As we talked about the disclosures that I have are available through the Academy's online disclosure program. None of them are really directly related to the uh, content of this talk. I'm just going to get rid of this and then do that. So, you know, the reality is that we, we all are physicians first and our patients are our priority and we concentrate on healing and medicine and the science and the art of delivering healthcare. But for most of us, especially those of us in pra private practice, we can't ignore the fact that uh, healthcare delivery is a business. And at the end of the day, we've got to run a business and that business generally needs to be profitable in order for us to exist. And there can be some competing issues with running the business of healthcare along with the delivery of healthcare. On the business side, we wanna maximize all the things that you see on your left, volume and productivity, efficiency, throughput. We wanna maintain customer service. We wanna maximize patient care and education, but we wanna minimize our expense side. So things like quality, compliance, accreditation, safety, technology, EMR, and those can be at times competing interests. Physician extenders can be very helpful in providing ways for us to provide better outreach to our patients to increase the um, productivity side and not necessarily decrease the or, or increase the expense side. And I think if you use these people prop properly, they can be cost neutral to cost positive, and they will infinitely improve your experience and your patient's experience. Physician extenders are, are a variety of things. In orthopedics, they tend to be a large quantity of physician assistants, but we can use nurse practitioners, athletic trainers, and medical assistants. These are generally the four big categories of what we would consider physician extenders. This is my team. Um, I have three physician assistants and one medical assistant. This is my clinical team that's with me every day in the office or, or the surgery, or most of them are with me every day in office or a surgery facility. I have two admins and an MA that also serves as a patient concierge. So this is the team that we use to help um, deliver the care that we, uh, we do so in our practice. What can these physician extenders do? Well, really they can act almost like you, not quite like you, but almost like you in terms of being your partner in practice. And they can do all of these different things that help to deliver care for patients. And frankly, many of the things that as physicians is probably not a valuable use of our time and actually decreases our productivity if we spend time on some of these things versus delegating it to the appropriate uh, person. 
it's catching on. The reality is that uh, particularly as we see downward pressures on healthcare, we're relying more and more on physician extenders uh, to deliver care and to deliver large parts of the care experience to our patients. And in, in addition, as we try to increase our throughput, particularly if you wanna to try to maintain that patient experience and that uh, uh, ability to communicate directly with patients, these physician extenders are really important for you to be able to increase your volume without decreasing your uh, quality of care that you're delivering. There's a variety of these uh, different people that I talked about, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, athletic trainers. Here's just a little bit of the background on who they are, what type of training they have, and what are the various different, quote unquote, uh, services they can provide to your patients. So whether they can prescribe or not prescribe, whether they can see uh, patients on their own or not on their own. And we'll talk a little bit about how they get reimbursed uh, in the future. So the considerations is, first of all, do you need an extender? And I think you have to ask yourself what, who, and how much to make that determination. So what am I lacking? What, what problem am I trying to solve for? Do I wanna get busier, but still provide face time to my patient? Do I need help in the OR? Am I getting bogged down by things like billing and documentation that's really taking up too much of my time so that I finish my clinic at four, but I'm not leaving my office till seven? Is my clinic very inefficient because I've got to go after every patient and walk back to my EMR and plug in uh, notes and physical therapy scripts and, and prescriptions or schedule patients on my own? Am I having trouble keeping up with correspondences with my patients such that I'm losing satisfaction? Of course, we're all concerned about the expense. And so the question is who bears the expense and who gets the revenue and what's the business model in terms of the ins and outs for this. And hopefully I'll show you that for some of these physicians, physician extenders, it can actually be a cost positive center versus a cost negative center. And then you've really got to be honest with yourself about how much of your patient care are you willing to delegate to that physician extender. So if you're going to have them, you want to utilize them appropriately and feel comfortable about training that person so that they can essentially be you when you're not available in large part. Does it increase my risk? Will patients be angry if I do not see them? I think this comes back to training, introducing, empowering your physician extender, and then letting them do what they're good at. And as patients get to know them, and they frankly get to know them better than they get to know you, they will see them as trusted providers within their healthcare episode. And this can be true of multiple PAs, PAs and ATCs, uh, PAs and MAs, any combination will work. It just depends on what your specific needs are for your practice. This is kind of the thought process that I think is helpful in determining which of these extenders are is right for you. The PAs are probably most close to a surgeon mentality. Uh, their ability to bill in the OR in the clinical setting generally makes them cost neutral or in many cases cost positive. I think the nurse practitioner is very helpful, particularly in our world. Let's say you're a, a high volume orthoplasty surgeon doing a lot of complex revision work in older patients who are in the hospital or require a lot of time for preoperative clearance and office-based issues related to medical complications. A nurse practitioner may be helpful. If you really need someone who's just gonna help you in the office, so they're gonna be your scribe, they're gonna put on casts, they're gonna take out sutures, they're gonna fit braces, they're gonna help you with notes, uh, then those are it, things that can be handled by an ATC or an MA and potentially lower the cost to you of, uh, of that uh, physician extender in terms of their salary. And then ATCs can sometimes also get a first assist surgical license, depending on the state that you're in, and that may allow you to improve efficiency, but generally is not a reimbursable event. And so for, I think for most of us, the PA really turns out to be the best option in a busy surgical orthopedic practice. In terms of the cost, these are the current salaries for a PA. The median is about 115,000, the 75th percentile, 135,000, 25th percentile, 95,000. And remember, this is just the salary line for the PA themselves. You have to figure probably not 1.5, but somewhere between 1.3 uh, when you figure in malpractice, uh, CME benefits. And then if you're going to bonus them, then maybe a little bit more over the top of that. So understand what your budget is when you start to decide on who that extender may be. The PA's scope of practice is basically doing anything under your discretion or your supervision. So for my PAs, they're with me in the OR, they're with me in the office, they see office patients independently, they do all of our initial post-op care, they're making graphs, they're positioning patients, they're helping me to run two rooms, they, they really can be valuable extensions of you, and once they're trained appropriately and have been with you for a while, the beauty is they know exactly what you do, how you do it, and how you think. And so they're almost one step ahead of you in terms of taking care of patients or preparing you for your day, which takes a lot of the load off your back. 
Uh, they are independent in clinic, but not surgery. There's really no one who's independent uh, in surgery, but they are independent in the sense that if uh, if you're done in a room with the critical portion of a case, they can finish that case. They can get set up in another room. They can potentially even uh, do the basic starting of a procedure, but obviously they're not going to do a procedure independently. What are the benefits? The benefits, I think, are increased patient satisfaction, increased revenue to your practice, and increased flexibility. They really allow you to expand your practice. They'll allow you to improve your access because, for example, they can be seeing patients on a day when you're in the OR. So if somebody calls, they've got an acute clavicle fracture, they want to get in. Instead of seeing we can't see them until next Monday, your PA will see them that day. PAs are great for initially screening patients, getting all of the workup done so that when that patient sees you, they're ready to go with all of the clinical decision-making information that you need. They're also great as a screening tool. So if you see a patient who needs a, a total knee for a sports medicine fracture uh, practice, for example, instead of them wasting their time with you, they see that PA, maybe they get an injection and then they get sent along their way to a joint replacement surgeon. And it really does allow you to rebalance your life. The impact on workload, Physicians who employ an extender generally work one week less per year, uh, increase office hours for visits, increase patient satisfaction, and the bottom line is your life simply gets better when you have these people well-trained and working within your practice. Patient satisfaction, you think it's going to go down. It actually goes way up because you're seeing more patients in clinic, but you're still decreasing wait times. The amount of face time that a patient gets because they really qualify face time, not only with you, but with your physician extenders. So the extenders in the room before you, they're in the room after you, they're thoroughly explaining the day of surgery, answering questions, providing education. Those are things that patients equate to your practice and you, they don't separate you from your extender. They improve patient education. They allow you to prioritize new patients moving, for example, injections or post-operative care into PA clinics. And in my practice, every one of our patients gets direct email access to our PAs, which generally means that all requests or answers are done within 12 hours. And that's a huge benefit to patients. So, you know, we get patients from some of the academic medical centers around us who say, you know, I was trying to get in touch with somebody for 10 days to get my MRI result and I never heard back. Whereas in our practice, you send an email in the morning, you generally have an afternoon uh, response to, to uh, your inquiry. In terms of patient satisfaction, it's pretty clear in my experience, as well as some of the literature that's out there, patients are very satisfied with PA care. They view PAs as an extension of you and your practice, and they are trusted healthcare providers. So especially if you empower them during the introduction phase, you know, this is my PA, they're available for any questions. You're going to see them at the first post-op visit. You'll see me at six weeks. You'll see them again at 12 months. And then I'll see you once again at six months, but they're in constant communication with me. If there's ever an issue, I'm directly available in your care. So you've got to take a little time to make sure you empower PAs in your practice to make sure that patients trust them. This is what has really been life-changing for me is the surgeon satisfaction. I'm a little bit embarrassed to say, but frankly, I don't even know how to use our EMR. I don't know how to access the hospital EMR system because my PA do, does all of it for me. All of the pre-op orders, all of the post-op orders, surgical scheduling, they do all of the non-surgical billing that happens in clinic. I probably dictate less than five charts per day. They do all of my patient callbacks and they do all of the post-surgery calls. Um, in the operating room, they significantly improve my efficiency. So even though we have residents coming through, we have fellows coming through, they are the constant. They know how I like to set things up. They know where the incision goes. They know what instruments we need. They know when to tell a fellow, you got to wait for Dr. Verma to come in because you really shouldn't do that, or that's the problem. We need to think about another way. They're two steps ahead of you in the operating room, which significantly improves your efficiency. And they really have helped me to become a, a very efficient two-room surgeon to the point where we can do 10 or 12 cases and be done by three or four o'clock. Better patient care. Frankly, as you start to increase volume, this is how you provide attention to detail. When you have these people working on your team and they're working collaboratively, they really know exactly what's going on. So a good example is a patient that comes in, has a history of a DVT, needs to be tracked and placed on anticoagulation postoperatively. They're aware of it. They've already talked to the hematologist. They know what our plan's going to be. The, the uh, medications are already sent to the pharmacy the night before, and it doesn't get missed on the day of surgery. How do we bill and reimburse for these per people? Well, for PA specifically, third-party payers generally pay at 0.85 of a physician rate when they're acting independently. You can bill this so-called incident two, which means they're essentially working under your direct local supervision in seeing a patient. Frankly, that's very hard to achieve. It would basically mean 
uh, I'm down the hall seeing patients, my PA is in the other hall seeing patients, and I'm directly available to supervise them. You could do it. It's hard to justify if you're in the operating room and they're in the clinic. And frankly, I just, I, I don't do it because I think it's, it's a hard documentation and potentially a compliance issue if you get called out on it. What's really powerful is that they generally will pay 30% as a surgical assistant. And the vast majority of codes that we use in shoulder and elbow surgery are re uh, uh, reproducible. We talked about incident two billing. Be careful on the Medicare side when you do this. That's probably where our most risk is. And then if you do have residents and fellows and you work out of a main hospital setting where you're working at a hospital where the residents and fellows are funded by the Medicare system, you have to be a little critical about uh, documenting in your operative notes that no qualified resident was assist, uh, available to directly assist during the case if you're going to bill a PA. So we're very careful about our PA billing in the hospital for CMS. We're very liberal about it for non-CMS payers, and we're extremely liberal about it uh, in the outpatient setting where um, the ASC is not responsible for the cost of care of, or excuse me, for the cost of salary for that uh, uh, resident. These are some of the codes and what they may be valued at. So you can see if they're seeing six patients per week or more, you can make probably 25K just on the patient visit side. And then once you add in the, the uh, second assist billing side for a, a busy clinical practice, you can easily equate or uh, exceed the cost of the PA in terms of the revenues that they generate. So it really becomes a, a revenue neutral to a revenue uh, positive situation. These are all the things that the, the PAs do in, in my practice. They do all of our post-op visits, all of our uh, last final follow-up visits or discharges for patients that are doing well. They're in clinic with me. So all three PAs are together with me when I'm in clinic. We have two PAs in the uh, operating room and one PA in clinic on our operative days. So every day of the week, somebody from our clinical practice is seeing patients. Uh, they do all our ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections. They do the perioperative cares. They prepare records for me for IMEs and addendums. They expand some of our hours at our satellite clinics. They're helpful in outreach to the community, providing team coverage. And again, even with three PAs, we can get to a point where we're generally cost neutral to cost positive. So the pearls is don't value your extender only by the dollar collected. In many cases, you'll be close to neutral, but the value that they bring to your practice is really difficult to put into monetary terms. Make sure you delegate and empower them, manage patient expectations and enable your extender. Give them ownership and independence. You want them to be satisfied. You want them to buy into your practice. Give them some metrics about here's what our goals are for this year. And if we meet those goals, then everybody's going to be reported. Incentivize them to help grow your practice and to provide better patient care. Things like quality metrics, safety metrics, along with productivity met metrics. I think once you consider all of these factors, the, the decision is largely a no-brainer. And it always boggles my mind when some of the larger he health systems just can't figure out how to make it work because it's a very powerful way to improve productivity without bringing on additional physicians. Thanks very much. Nick, thanks so much. That was fantastic. Um, you know, we don't have much time left. I have, I have a quick question for you. You know, some of the people listening maybe very early in practice may not feel like their practice is that busy or, ha or is, has that much volume. Is there kind of a, a time point at which you think it's best to look into having a PA? Or do you think you could have one uh, day one and, and grow with them? Or do you have to wait until you're a certain amount of busy? Yeah, I think there's a couple different philosophies on that. I don't think day one really makes a lot of sense for most people. And, and frankly, as you're just getting started, you're generally very hands-on in your practice. You know, you're seeing 10 patients a day and you're going out of your way to make sure that you're spending as much time as with them as you can. Uh, the way we generally grow is for our, our new practices, they have either an individual or a shared MA or ATC. So they have some help to do things like refill medications and uh, deal with PT prescriptions so that they're not constantly at the computer when they're in clinic. And generally, once they get to about the 200 to 250 cases per year mark is when we um, allocate them a PA. So it's generally within one to two years of clinically starting a practice. And our experience has been that that's about the mark that you need to be at to start to make a P, excuse me, a PA, a cost neutral asset to your practice. That's great. Well, you know, I, I, it's getting late. We're five minutes over. I'd like to um, thank the panelists. Those were fantastic talks. Again, to everybody who joined, thank you. Um, it will be available if you want to slow things down and, and rewatch this. It'll be available via ASCS. Um, thank you to Steve and Dr. Sperling and to the ASCS um, Practice Management Task Force. Everybody have a great night.